Have you peace in your heart? This morning, a real, deep, lasting peace. Or have you got a little ounce of anxiety ticking in there? There's much to keep many in this land anxious and fretful and concerned. And what I want you to know this morning is this, you could have peace. Jabs give some people a peace of mind and then they're told, oh, I'll need a booster. I'll be anxious till I get that. And then they get a booster and maybe we'll go down the road of a booster on a booster. Some things give warranties a year, maybe two years, to give you some peace in case the thing that they offer breaks and then you know at least, well, I'll get it fixed. But in the gospel, Jesus Christ promises for those who come to him in faith a peace that lasts, that won't break and will not need a replacement. Paul spells out in four great affirmations in our reading this morning how we can have that peace. And I'll begin. The first thing is when you come to know Christ is for us. Paul says, what shall we say if God is for us? Who can be against us? Notice what the apostle did not begin with. He doesn't begin that section by saying, who's against us? What do you think the answer would be? Who's against us, Paul? Uh, The Roman Caesar and a very highly trained Roman army. Who's against us? The Jewish leaders. Is that not enough to be getting on with? Who's against us? Our pagan relations who haven't taken kindly to us becoming Christians. Who's against us? Most of the mainstream media within the countries against us, Paul. Who's against us? Those who say they're progressive, but once they hear us talk about Jesus, they want to drum us out of the universities, the colleges, and the schools. Who's against us? Oh, Paul. Sometimes we ask who's not against us. So he doesn't begin by saying who's against us because he knows the answer. So Paul begins differently. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can ultimately be against us? Who can finally on the end be against us? Because all will be accountable to God. There are temporary losses We lose privileges, we lose freedoms, we lose friendships, we lose getting night call on ITV, for those of you who can remember back to the 1980s when I grew up, so I remember it. Each day used to close, imagine this, with a Christian minister offering a reflection and a blessing on the country. Wow, what a country that must have been to live in. If God is for us, There is nobody who can ultimately be against us. We might incur small losses, but we get the ultimate gain. Jesus says to his followers, you know, when you come to me in faith, when you become a Christian, you understand this, not even the gates of hell prevail against the church. And thus we derive our peace when we can say in our hearts, Christ is for us. Paul goes beyond that, and he says in verse 32 that Christ loves us. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up, crucified him on the cross, will he not give us all things? What will we get? That's a thing people might ask. What do you get when you're a Christian? I see you still get cancer. I see you still have to bury your children who maybe served in the forces. So what do you, what do you get that's so good? Paul doesn't begin with that, does he? He says, he who gave us his own son, what will we get? We get everything. You get to see that God loves you. Several years ago, I was speaking with someone who said that they believed in God, but they had a great problem with me. That's maybe not unusual, you may be thinking. But they said, it's terrible that you believe God killed his son on a cross. What an awful thing to believe. I believe my God 
loves me as I am. That's what they said to me. My God loves me as I am. And Edward, he, he doesn't need a crucifixion. He doesn't want one. He just loves me as I am. Your God, he said, oh, Jesus on a cross, being humiliated in front of family and friends and enemies. Oh, that's terrible. Can't see any good you derive from that. And in a moment, I believe, was led by God's Spirit. I was able to say to that person, at what cost does your God love you? Well, at no cost, he said. He loves me as I am. And you take peace from that, I said. You can take peace from the fact that you have a God that loves you without any cost. Now, those of us who are parents know there's a cost to the love we have for our children. We sacrifice our time. We give of our energy. We give of our money. We love them, and we make sacrifice for them. And we hope one day they look back and they say, I appreciate that, Mum. Thank you for that, Dad. I said, your God loves you without any cost to himself whatsoever. My God, the Christian God, he loves at the most enormous cost to himself. He paid the ultimate cost by dying in my place and rising to conquer my death. Whose God loves who more? So this is why Paul says, he who gave his son for us, will he not give us all things? We can know that Christ is for us and take peace from it. And you can know Christ loves you. Take peace from it. Then Paul says, and Christ knows us. Verse 33, who will bring any charge against us? Who will condemn us? Who will blame us? Who will accuse us? It's Christ who died and was raised to life and is at the right hand of God praying for us. You ever been accused? Even those accusations which are 99% right, what can you say? You weren't being accused by a perfect person, were you? You could have been in the wrong. But the person who is accusing you don't they have a broken heart as well? Accusing and condemning other fallible and broken people. And Paul says, but in Christ, he knows us completely. His judgment of us is not clouded. I don't need to worry whether he's got a secret jealousy, whether he's going behind my back for some other reason. No, his knowledge is perfect. He has conquered the grave. He alone gets to call me out at the end. And it's a good thing. I have peace from that. I dread to think what we would make of one another if we were really given the power to carry that exercise out. But the gospel tells us only Christ does that. And his knowledge and authority is perfect. And if you're in Christ by faith, there won't be condemnation. You'll be vindicated. Finally, you'll be united. Paul says, Christ is with us. What shall separate us from the love of God? And then he gives a list and he says nothing. I wonder if our country, though it's at its most technological, is also at its most lonely. Many people are concerned about where the pounds are going to come from. And whether we need to have more lockdowns. Then they're concerned about the businesses that fold. It's a shame nobody was too concerned about all those people who lived alone. And had no internet. It's very easy when you're my age and you conduct your business over Zoom. What if you're in your 90s and you've never held an iPad? You've no children. You live in a city surrounded by strangers. You know, loneliness is a greater affliction than poverty. 
You can have friends and be a pauper. You can be a king and be utterly alone. Facebook friends are not real friends. You might have some real friends on Facebook. Not always the same thing. Paul promises when you come to Christ, you're united to him and he loves you and you'll never be separated from him. And those that you've known who've loved Christ will be with you where he is. A place where there is no loneliness and isolation. Humans are made for relationship and the ultimate relationship is offered in the gospel. So in a day when we think of the turmoil of war and call for repentance over the brokenness of the human heart that's meant many men and women have had to serve at enormous cost. And that's just not those who have died. Every airman, naval personnel and soldier has had to put themselves in harm's way so we can taste safety. We can say this morning, though we call for repentance, we can also pronounce peace. And not through COP26 or the circuses in Holyrood or Westminster, but because in Christ we have one who is for us, who loves us, who knows us, and who is with us. Amen and thanks be to God.